so my name is Cheney Ryan, and I want to say first of all that uh, it's great to be here on the same program with Jan Narvison, um, whose work has provoked me as it has provoked other people. Uh, I probably disagree with him on every matter about pacifism, uh, but that's the great part about philosophy is that we provoke each other in that way. I would say, though, that Jan wrote wonderful things about John Rawls very early on that I've always thought in fact, I agree with Jerry Cohen on this, that never got the attention at the time that they deserved, so I recommend also that people work, look at Chan's work on that. Now, uh, l let me also say before I start reading this, because I am going to read it, I find actually that I do better reading things. Uh, uh, D D Daniel, I think, is right in his characterization of some of the discussion of this. That is, that the discussion of just war theory uh, involving David Roden and Jeff McMahon and Helen Fowden and others in this room the discussion of just war theory, some of that discussion has led people to believe uh, that, that pacifism is looming in front of them. Uh, uh, and, and that, uh, so some of the discussion is about to what extent is that true and, and what do we make of that. Uh, I am now at Oxford University part of the time because uh, I was invited to Oxford basically to develop the view of pacifism from that and so I'm, I'm running a thing called the Pacifism Project at Oxford. I'd invite anyone here who's interested in that to talk to me. And in fact, we'll probably be doing something next spring at Oxford also on pacifism. And I hope that people uh, uh, here could attend that or certainly let me know if, if you want to attend it. Now, I generally don't make a point of talking about the differences between <coughs> pacifism and just war theory for, for reasons that partly arose from what Jan said. In practice, that is, in their judgments about wars, pacifists and, and strict just war theorists generally don't disagree about, uh, about things. And that's because strict, war just, strict just war theorists are generally very, very critical of most wars. So I've always thought that it's a mistake to make too much sometimes about the difference between pacifism and just war theory. But what I will do today is make a big deal about the difference uh, I will try to be provocative, as provocative as I can, in criticizing just war theory. Uh, and I'm assuming that, that when I'm done, people will come back with guns blazing, to use a metaphor. Uh, right. When people hear the word pacifism, they imagine a world in which large numbers of people are helpless before the predations of aggressive forces. They imagine a world in which innocent men, women, and children are slaughtered by political tyrants with impunity. We have good reason to worry about such a world because this is exactly what a century of state-run just wars has given us. Just war theory claims to tell us what good wars look like. A larger perspective reveals that good wars produce bad wars, produce good wars, produce bad wars, and on and on and on with little hope of escaping the cycle unless our fundamental categories are rethought and our basic practices revised. Pacifism is the name for this radical project of rethinking and revision, which aims above all to be a gesture of hope in a world beset by violence. The essay that follows is an invitation to join me in this project. The term pacifism is a century and a half old. And over time, it has meant different things to different people. We speak of pacifism as a position. It might better be thought of as a persuasion, as historians use this term, a matched set of attitudes, beliefs, and projected actions, some unformulated but constituting a distinctive orientation towards the world. There are versions of pacifism that are easy to refute, as there are versions of any political doctrine that are easy to refute. Such refutations reflect more on the version chosen than the doctrine itself. Arguments about what pacifism really means are uninteresting, except insofar as they compel us to consider how the pacifist position has unfolded over time, something I shall consider. One problem is that the pacifist and just war traditions have converged over time, rendering their differences increasingly less clear. Consider the contrast between just war thinking and pacifism 100 years ago. Then, just war thinking was blatantly celebratory. War was good in itself, apart from any specific aims. It was a theater of masculine virtue and a source of political regeneration. 
President Theodore Roosevelt, the first great liberal president, held that if a country had no wars to fight, it should find one. Accordingly, he urged his country to invade Canada to revive its national energies, a kind of political Viagra. I, I realize not that might not be meaningful. Um, and, and Roosevelt ridiculed pacifists as mollycoddles, that is, sissies, for opposing this. Well, the horrors of the 20th century took the bloom off this sort of thinking. Pacifist views that were ridiculed before are now taken as common sense. So that anyone look at comparing 100 years ago, today, to now, would say that pacifism has largely won the argument. The reason why the quarrel between pacifism and just war thinking often reduces today to an argument about self-defense is that this is one of the remaining issues where people remain unconvinced of the pacifist critique of war. Hence, this will be my focus here. Any discussion of pacifism must begin with the fact that there are two quite different types of pacifism. Now, what I'm going to say kind of maps onto what Jan says, but I'm going to sort it out a little bit differently, and I will and also, also make more of a distinction. There are two quite different types. The first is religious pacifism, or what I call prophetic pacifism. In the 19th century, this perspective was called non-resistance. Its champions in America included William Lloyd Garrison, the leading abolitionist. Its most prominent global voice was Leo Tolstoy. 20th century proponents have included Dorothy Day and John Howard Yoder. Passing of this type emerged with the first Christian communities in reaction to imperial Rome, then re-emerged as the left wing of the Protestant Reformation in reaction to the Roman church and its support for imperial projects. Prophetic pacifism is a personal ethic, first and foremost, that renounces all killing. It has never presented itself as an ethic for everyone, nor has it presented itself as a politics, that is, as a program for reconstructing the state. Quite the contrary, its strongest proponents uh, perceive it as an anti-political doctrine. The best, uh, the best uh, voice of this type of pacifism today is Stanley Hauerwas, but also John Howard Yoder, who I've mentioned, his writings on this type of pacifism are really the starting point for anyone who's interested in this more absolutist form of pacifism. Many people today equate pacifism with this uncompromising rejecting of all killing, but this is a mistake. The term only acquired this sense in the 1930s. Prior to this, as noted, the rejection of all killing was called non-resistance. In fact, the term pacifism was originally coined to distinguish itself from this more absolutist view. Moreover, people often equate this uncompromising rejection of all killing with, the right to, with a rejection of the right to self-defense. This strikes me as a mistake as well. Prophetic pacifists hold that one should refrain from killing in self-defense. But to put this claim in the language of individual rights is to assume a framework that is foreign to this tradition, given that it long preceded that framework. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek, he was not claiming that we have no right not to do otherwise. Hence, no prophetic pacifist that I know of has ever denied that individuals have a right to self-defense, or has held that individuals should be condemned for defending themselves. I don't know anyone who's ever said that, it, that, that, that people should be condemned for defending themselves. Now, there have been cases where people urged a strategy of non-self-defense, from a pacifist point of view. By the way, there have been an equal number of cases where they've urged the same thing from a just war point of view. Uh, the main point, though, is that the kind of absolutism that rejects all killing is not an absolutism that puts that in terms of no right to self-defense. Differences remain on whether self-defense is justified, but they begin with the question of what counts as a justification here, meaning they are subtler because they are deeper, raising questions about the status of morality itself. On this, I could not agree with Jan Moore. That is, the difference between this more absolutist pacifism and other views really does get us into fundamental questions of morality. I think he's right about that. The second type of pacifism I call political pacifism. Though the two overlap at times, its, or, uh, its origins are primarily secular. It is anticipated in the skeptical figures of Renaissance humanism like Erasmus, and the more anti-war views of the Enlightenment, but political pacifism proper emerged in the 19th century in response to the Napoleonic Wars and the consolidation of the European state system that followed. 
It flourished again after World War I, which, saw it, which it saw as confirming all its criticisms of what it called the war system. Unlike prophetic pacifism, political pacifism has been very influential. It played an important role in the humanitarian and arbitration movements of the late 19th century. The leading American progressive politician at the turn of the century, William Jennings Bryan, was a lifelong pacifist, always called himself a pacifist, who resigned as Secretary of State over the America's entry into World War I. Political pacifism influenced the first international institutions after that war. Political pacifism does not reject all violence, but it does reject all war, because it rejects the use of killing as a political tool. It affirms that people have a right to self-defense. It denies that war has anything to do with that right. Indeed, now that we have abolished slavery, the military remains the only institution in which you can lose your legal right to self-defense. If prophetic pacifism is a personal ethic, political pacifism's focus is structural. For it, war is a product of states or the state system, which are prone to systemic political crises, much as Marx felt the capitalist system was prone to systemic economic crises. The heart of the problem is state sovereignty. The authority of each state over its people and resources, which divides the international order into a public and private realm, and means that each state can accumulate the weapons of war faster than the collective ability to control them. Hence, national security creates global insecurity, rendering the system inherently unstable. It also means that states can mobilize people and resources for war in ways that constitute a massive violation of their individual rights, rendering the system inherently unjust. Political pacifists are not alone in these concerns. The pension of states for war was first detailed by Rousseau and was recognized by almost everyone in the late 19th century. The injustice problem has been recognized by thinkers since Hobbes and Locke, who both doubted that war could be reconciled with the rights of soldiers. Hegel and 19th century thinkers held that, a conflict, held that war conflicted with individual rights generally, as did John Dewey. These thinkers did not reject war, though, because they felt that war had other virtues that justified its violation of rights. Finally, the conflict of war and rights is part of American law. The Supreme Court of the United States' draft law decision of 1918 affirmed that state sovereignty trumps the rights of individuals in times of war. Prophetic pacifists and political pacifists differ on personal self-defense. But this is never translated into a disagreement about war, because neither side thinks that war has anything to do with personal self-defense. Since political pacifism affirms the right on the individual level, its disagreement with contemporary just war thinking is most direct, so I shall focus on it here, and henceforth by pacifism I'll mean political pacifism. I'm happy to defend the other type of pacifism. So in the discussion, I can give you the responses to the kinds of issues that Jan raised about the more absolutist form. But what I'm going to focus on here is what I'm calling the political form. Okay? The disagreement seems clear. Just war theory believes that war can be fought without massive rights violations or with an acceptable level of them. Pacifism denies this even in wars of self-defense. For just war theory, war can be just. For pacifism, it is intrinsically unjust. Unfortunately, further differences complicate this picture. For pacifism, war is an enterprise of sovereign states. Its claim rests on an understanding of what a state is, what sovereignty is, both of which define what war is. Absent attention to these, political pacifism holds that our reflections will be hopelessly abstract with little bearing on the world as it really is. But this is exactly what contemporary just war theory does in the eyes of the pacifist. It says little about states, little about sovereignty, and little about war as a distinct political practice, taking them as unproblematic. Ironically, pacifism claims to be the more realistic doctrine in addressing the institutional and historical dimensions. So the differences are methodological as well as substantive, hence one that will be sketched but not resolved in what follows. I start with some words on self-defense, which just war theorists today take as a fixed point of just war thinking. Prior to the 20th century, self-defense was not a central consideration in thinking about war. Augustine, the founder of just war theory, flatly rejected self-defense as grounds for just war. And later, just war theorists gave little attention to it. The principal concern of the international system that emerged after Napoleon 
was maintaining the balance of power. War was legitimate, war was legit, hence war was legitimate that served that end, even if it meant one state attacking another. Its role, was, and, and also self-defense role was secondary well into the 20th century. For example, it first appeared in international treaty practice with the Treaty of Locarno in 1925, where the western borders of Germany were guaranteed. As late as 1928, the United States objected to including the right of legitimate self-defense in the Pact of Paris on the grounds that it did not lend itself to precise definition. Subsequent events confirmed these worries. The first appeal to self-defense was by Japan, justifying its invasion and occupation of Manchuria as a defense of the rights and interests on which Japan's very existence depended. Its next major use uh, in international treaty practice was by Italy, justifying its invasion of Ethiopia on the grounds of legitimate self-defense. Thinking about self-defense started to change with World War I, which was the first major war where everyone claimed to be acting in self-defense. As Hugh Strawn notes in his monumental history of that war, the appeal to self-defense was crucial to mobilizing the support of women, who were otherwise, in his words, more dubious about the war than men. If soldiers were fighting to protect their families, and if a woman's support for war could be seen as an active maternal responsibility, Ben Strawn writes, a primitive and basic response could be rolled into the patriotism demanded of the modern state. And it was crucial to shattering the socialist opposition as well, writes Strawn, in both France and Germany, the left justified its support of the war by the need for national defense against a reactionary enemy. Hence, after the war, Max Weber insisted that Germany had been fighting a defensive war against Tsarism. Social Darwinism added to this picture of war as a battle for existence. Late 19th century paranoia about the struggle between races was mapped onto the conflict between Huns, Anglo-Saxons, etc., giving the war its apocalyptic character. The idea of a holy war, dormant since the 17th century, reemerged as the idea of a war for civilization's very existence. We still see this today, of course, uh, after 9-11, uh, the war of self-defense of the United States was inflated into a war for every single value possible. Uh, it's very, very hard to find many cases, there are some, where in fact this is not intrinsic to the argument for self-defense. After the war, this idolatry of self-defense generated a heated debate about the very notion. After World War I, one side held that the problem lay in how self-defense was interpreted. Things go wrong when the self, the collective identity being defended, is ambiguous or inflated. The principal task, then, is to specify what is being defended in self-defense. On this central question, though, there was total disagreement. For some, the bearer of sovereignty was the state. For others, it was the nation. The difference is huge, most obviously in the importance we give to territorial borders. Affirming the state means affirming existing borders, while affirming national self-determination is profoundly disruptive of borders insofar as they bear no relation to national groupings. World War I generated no clear choice between these, and World War II was partly a, a result of the conflict between them. Many of the wars in the, uh, in the 20th century are not wars of self-defense, but wars about what is worth defending, different issue. The other response after World War I was to reject the notion of national self-defense entirely, much as people now reject notions of national honor. This was the view of political pacifism. The great anti-war critic Randolph Bourne ridiculed the frenzy of self-defense, as he called it, as capable of justifying any injustice in war in our time. He foresaw self-defense becoming the ideology of now what we term of what we now term the national security state, where the line between peace and war, hence one war or another, becomes increasingly blurred, permanent war for permanent peace. This position regarded attempts to specify what is being defended as hopeless. National self-defense, like national honor, was intrinsically vague and given to inflation. My colleague Henry Hsu has spoken of the cancerous growth of the concept of national security and how it is used with an imprecision that would not be tolerated with other less important concepts. Political pacifism holds that this is implicit in the concept itself. Contemporary just war theory is a version of the first response. 
Contemporary just war theory seeks to specify, hence delimit, what is being defended by linking it to individual rights. Before turning to it, let me make one or two remarks on both positions. Well, let me make one remark on the two positions together. How important is justice? Both just war theory and political pacifism take justice to be very important. One says a just war theory can be fought, the other says war is intrinsically unjust. A problem, though, with this argument, the one I'll look at, is that for many people, justice probably won't be that important. That is, for many people would probably say, if a war involves massive violation of rights, there might still be reason to fight it, okay? So I'm not going to talk about that, because that's not the argument between political pacifism and just war theory, but that's not, that's not, not only not an unreasonable view, I think it's one that many people hold. Contemporary just war theory begins with Michael Walzer's Just and Unjust Wars, which will be a reference point in what follows. Many details of his argument have been challenged, but I think Walzer's framework remains the dominant one. That framework revolves around the problem of aggression, conceived as the violation of state sovereignty, the paradigm of which is the transgression of borders. That seems to me the basic framework that Rawls gives us, it seems to me still one that contemporary just war theory works within. Enough has been said in praise of Walter's achievement that my remarks will be entirely critical. For starters, his privileging of states sidesteps the major question of the 20, a major question of the 20th century of which is sovereign, states or nations. In this and other respects, Walter's framework is deeply ahistorical. Unless I have missed it, he does not address the major problem raised by the 20th century, why, against all expectations, the 20th century witnessed so much war that it became the bloodiest century in modern history. Walter's approach and subsequent just war theories, I think, is excessively anecdotal, bouncing around history, cherry-picking examples, while ignoring the actual question of why things unfolded so badly as they did. This sort of thing is useful for confirming what philosophers call our intuitions, in other words, prejudices, but it does little to provoke a critical assessment of the situation. The heart of contemporary just war theory is that the claim that there is an intimate relation between the state's right of self-defense and the individual's right of self-defense, rendering war just when the states act in defense of that right. That's the point that Daniel made at the very start. That's the focus of contemporary just war theory is the link between the state's right to self-defense and the individual's right to self-defense. Just war theory postulates a twofold relation. First, the right of the state is modeled on the right of the individual. What states can do in defense of themselves parallels what individuals can do in defense of themselves. This is the force of the so-called domestic analogy that Walter places at the heart of the legalist paradigm. Writes Walzer, every reference to aggression is the international equivalent of armed robbery or murder, and every comparison of home and country or personal liberty and political independence relies on what is called the domestic analogy. War is an especially complex social phenomenon that needs taming by analogies. This may explain the prevalence of domestic cases like individuals being assaulted on the street in philosophical discussions of war. But analogies can also mislead, and the most serious problem with likening the defense of a state to the defense of an individual is that it's comparing something hyper-political, a state, to something basically not political at all in the kinds of examples used, people walking down the street being mugged. And what that force of this analogy does, in my view, is basically ignore the distinctive fact about wars, which is that they are political phenomena and that's something I'll stress it one or two more times here. Second, according to just war theory, the right of, states, the, right of the state to self-defense is grounded in the individual right to self-defense. Writes Walter, the duties and rights of states are nothing more than the duties and rights of the men who compose them. Now this is the most novel part of the theory. 19th century thinkers regarded both individuals and states as bearers of rights or juridical subjects, but no one in the 19th century thought that the right of a state was just the aggregate of the same right of individuals in the same way that in American law corporations are ju juridical subjects, but no one would say that a corporation's right to free speech is just the aggregate 
of the free speech rights of the individuals that work for it. Quite the contrary, anyone would see that those come into conflict, that those conflict at times. A corporate right and an individual right. In the 19th century, that was taken as obvious. The state's right to self-defense obviously conflicts with the individual right to self-defense. They are two different types of things. So contemporary just war theories claim that the one is grounded in the other is a radical departure from how this had been thought of up until recently. For many, this reductionism in the second claim will be most controversial. It is hard to think of any other case in which the right of an institution is just the sum of the individual rights of its members. Prior to this, though, is the question of what it means to ascribe the right of self-defense to the state, as the first claim does, and that's the one that I'll focus on. To claim that a state has a right to self-defense is not just to claim that the state is worth defending. Many things are worth defending that do not have a right to self-defense. To say that the state has a right to self-defense is to say two things. That the state has a right to be defended, and it has the right to do the defending itself. The first means that the state does not need anyone's permission to be defended. The second means that it does not need anyone's help in defending itself. Thus conceived, the state's right to self-defense raises two issues. One is the question of what precisely the state is defending when the state defends itself. The other is the question of what precisely the state is entitled to do in defending itself. I discuss the first issue in the remainder of this section, turn to the next and the next section. Just war theory holds that just as individuals have a right to defend their lives, states have a right to defend their sovereignty. Right away, the analogy is worrisome. Life is something concrete and natural. Sovereignty is something abstract and socially constructed. Accrating the two risks obscuring this latter fact and the problem it raises. Sovereignty for just war theory today means two things, political independence and territorial integrity. David Roden unpacks it this way, persons are constituted by their existence as organic entities, states are constituted by their existence as sovereign entities, and have a claim right against other states not to destroy their political independence or interfere with their territorial integrity. Hence, just as individuals have the right to defend with lethal force their existence as organic entities, states have a right to defend with military force their existence as sovereign entities. Now, the problem with territorial integrity are some of the problems have already been noted. First of all, the very idea that what is most being defended is territorial integrity assumes that it's states that are defending themselves and not nations. So it simply assumes something which has been a major source of controversy throughout the 20th century, which is what is the bearer of sovereignty. The, um, the borders of much of Europe and the non-European world as well, borders which still serve to define much of the world today, the borders of Europe and the non-European world as well, uh, 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 during the deliberations at Paris after World War I, were decided in less than 26 days. No wonder no one took them seriously, and they have been a source of conflict ever since, most dramatically uh, in, in the Middle East. The domestic analogy invites us to liken aggression against the state to intrusions on one's house. There may be some truth to this, but not enough to ignore all those ways in which the cases are distinct, in particular all the moral ambiguity that pertains to the actions of states uh, and, and what's done to states in contrast to the kind of bite-sized domestic cases. A pacifist like me is often challenged on the Nazi invasion of Poland, a paradigm case of aggression for just war theory, which is invariably likened to someone's assaulting your grandmother on the street. But surely the matter is not this simple. Poland was invaded in 1939. The year before, Poland had supported Hitler's dismembership of Czechoslovakia and used the opportunity to seize a slice of Czech territory. My grandmother never did anything like this. <laughs> now the issue is not whether the Nazis are justified in what they did, which they were surely not, 
The point is whether the justification of killing rests on something as historically arbitrary and morally ambiguous as state boundaries. What states further defend in defending their sovereignty is their political independence. Political independence primarily refers to the state's status as ultimate authority within its own sphere. Its right to rule as it chooses, free of any external constraints, though not from domestic forces. This is the parallel between a state's defense of its sovereignty and an individual's defense of his or her autonomy. Thus conceived, though, I think there is a contradiction between just war theory's two claims. Its claim that states have a right to defend their sovereignty and its claim that that right is grounded in the individual right to self-defense of its members. Here's the contradiction. The latter would seem to make the state's right to defend itself conditional on whether it does defend its members' rights. It suggests that states have a right to self-defense to the degree that they are really liberal-type states. But sovereignty, as traditionally understood, has nothing to do with the type of state in question. Sovereignty means that states can do as they choose within their borders, which means they can choose not to defend their own people and still remain sovereign. The policies of the Soviet Union in World War II can only be understood as aimed at defending the Soviet state at the cost of its people's lives. Just War Theory's account of why sovereignty is worth defending, I think, does not take the traditional notion of sovereignty seriously. I imagine two responses to this. One is to grant that the right of self-defense applies only to liberal-type states, meaning states that place a primacy on defending the rights of its members, Hence, grant that war is justified only when the state being invaded is a liberal type state. I'll turn to this in a moment. A second response would, to be, would be to insist that defending their people is something that all states do, regardless of how liberal they are. Hence, states qua states do have a right to self-defense. This is an empirical claim about what states have actually done and do, and it seems to me Michael Walter's view, and understandably so. Walter presents his theory as summarizing just war thinking. A view that limited the right of self-defense to liberal type states would be a radical departure from that tradition. Walter grants, Walter grants that on his view, the moral standing of any particular state depends on the reality of the common life it protects and the extent to which the sacrifices required by that protection are willingly, willingly accepted and thought worthwhile. But Walter goes on to insist, but most states do stand guard over the community of their citizens, at least to some degree. That is why we assume the justice of their defensive wars. Most states, he says, arise from a long-term process by which the state comes to protect the shared experiences and cooperative activities of its people against external encroachment. Now, pacifists are often chastised for not living in the real world. But it would be hard to find an account of things more fanciful than Walter's. The claim that most states stand guard over the community of their citizens is extraordinary for anyone familiar with the 20th century, in which more people were killed by their own states than by the aggression from other states. States defend themselves, not their citizens. They defend their citizens when it is necessary to defend themselves, but they kill their citizens when the defense of the state requires it. Historically, war has as much to do with individual self-defense as rape has to do with procreation. They sometimes coincide, but only contingently. Hmm? <laughs> I'm going to break it off then and play the rest of it in discussion. Okay. The other response to this problem grants that we are talking about the hypothetical, not the real. It says that the right of self-defense exists to the extent that it defends, it defends the right of its individual members. McMahon is responding to David Roden's argument that the state's right to self-defense, uh, Roden's argument that the state's right cannot be granted the right of individuals. And here is McMahon's response, that is his argument that the right of the state can be granted the right of individuals. Here's, here's McMahon. Imagine a case in which a person uses violence and self-defense. 
Then imagine a case in which two people engage in self-defense against a threat they jointly face. Continue to imagine further cases in which increasing numbers of people act with increasing coordination to defend themselves. What you are imagining is a spectrum of cases that begin with acts of individual self-defense, and as the threat becomes more complex, the threatened individual is more numerous, their defensive actions integrated. If war, in at least some instances, lies in a continuum with individual self-defense, then war can be morally justified, or at least in principle. Now, the word state does not appear in McMahon's remark. His justification from war, for war abstracts from the question of the state, just as justifications of capitalism often abstract from the question of the corporation. As such, I'm not sure what to make of this argument. It basically says, assume that the right of individual self-defense is aggregated in a way that violates no one's rights, and you see, therefore, that war violates no one's rights. McMahon will respond, we can imagine this happening, and with sufficient imagination, he's probably right. If we accept John Locke's imagining slavery can be justified, if we accept Robert Nozick's imaginings capitalism can be justified, if we accept enough ticking bomb imaginings torture can be justified. In any event, it does nothing to refute the political pacifist whose claim is not that war in principle is unjustified, but that war in reality is unjustified. Now, um, in the part that I'm not going to be able to read to you, but I could summarize if you like, I discuss the further issue about um, uh, uh, the, the, further, the, the further problem about how self-defense tends to inflate necessarily so. So it's not just the fact about World War I that it was inflated. In fact, that process is described in Hobbes' as Leviathan. I think it's been present from the start. Where does this leave us? The argument between political pacifism and just war theory is an argument about whether war can be fought in a way that does not involve massive violations of rights. That is not an argument about what we can imagine. That is a discussion about what war is and how it's actually fought. The political pacifist begins with, uh, with the argument on his or her side, because almost every empirical case of a war that you present with me, I can show you massive rights violations that it involves. So I think actually the burden is on the political pacifist to make a case against the history of the 20th century that war is not an intrinsic violation of rights as it, as it was in that time. Let me make one final remark, okay? One final remark. The right of self-defense is the right not only of the self to be defended, but the right of the self to defend itself. Now, an interesting thing is that self-defense, national self-defense, became increasingly important in political philosophy at the end of the 20th century, just when most people in developed Western countries decided that they had no interest in participating in that self-defense. Israel is really the exception here. And this remark bears on a, 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 a thing that was said at the start about whether the pacifist is a free writer. The true free writers are the people who say, I believe in war of self-defense. But what I believe in is hiring someone, a person of color, or a poor person to do that defending for me. That strikes me as the real free writing, and that's what wars of self-defense mean in countries like the United States today. And once again, I think there I would raise the question, do just war theories really believe in self-defense, or, or do they believe in defense which is outsourced to somebody else? Thank you.